Well, good morning to you. I want to say welcome to New Life Community Church. Uh, my name is Kyle. I serve as the lead pastor here and uh, grateful that you've chosen to worship with us today. If you're a member here, we're happy to see you. Uh, if you have your Bible, would you turn to John chapter 3? should be no surprise now where we'll be at. We'll be in John 3 today and uh, for the next several weeks, uh, but today we'll be examining together verse 3. Uh, we started a series a few weeks ago called The Law and the Gospel, and uh, the point of the series is to expose the law as unable to save us, to highlight the good news of Christ Jesus as the only way to salvation, and this idea that you must be born again. When we say the law is unable to save, we don't mean that the law is not good. The law is good. Uh, but you following the law perfectly will not result in salvation, nor could you follow the law perfectly anyway. And so you must be born again. And that's what we've been looking at with Nicodemus uh, here, is that uh, he, like every other person, as we'll see today, must be born again. And so we'll get into that today. I'm going to ask that you stand again, if you're able, for the, the reading of God's Word. We're going to read verses 1 through 3 of John 3 today. John 3, verse 1, Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. And Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the kindness of revelation that we have in your word, uh, our triune God revealing himself to us. And so, Father, we come to you with, with that in mind. We want to know you. We want to know your Son we want you to work in our hearts and minds by the power of your spirit today, and so we ask, Lord, for that. We ask you to enlighten us, to illuminate the passage for us today, that we would know you. Um, Lord, we praise you for, the, for your word, for your written word, and we ask that you be with us now. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. But the thing that I want to lay before you today, if you're taking notes, you can write this down, uh, what, what Jesus has just said is shocking. It's a shocking statement. And the thing that I think this passage reveals is this, is that the shocking news of the new birth reveals to us the saving news of new life in Christ. It reveals to us the saving news of new life in Christ. Have you ever received shocking news? You ever gotten that phone call with a, a report on the other end that rocks you to your core? The kind of news that causes your world to spin in a moment. Maybe it's the kind of news that etches a, a day and a time into your mind forever. You'll always remember that moment when that phone call or when that news broke or when that thing happened to you. I can remember where I was when I got the call uh, that my dad had had a heart attack a little over a decade ago now, but maybe one incident that we can remember together would be uh, that it's impacted us like this would be the terror attacks of 9-11. Most of us can easily recall, and we do so yearly, where we were in that moment, what we were doing. Nicodemus would have felt rocked as Jesus exclaims to him, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. That statement pierced, no doubt, it pierced Nicodemus. Much of God's Word is meant to pierce us. God describes His Word in this way as an object that pierces us to the very depths of our soul, exposing who we are, what we are, for what it really is, for what we really are. And that would have happened to Nicodemus in this moment. Nicodemus no doubt thought he had a secure status with 
God due to his religious pedigree. We've talked about it already. Nicodemus is a Pharisee. He's a member of the Sanhedrin even, which is the ruling body of the nation of Israel. He was called, Jesus calls him here in verse 10 in this passage, he asked him, are you the teacher of Israel and yet you do not know these things? He was the teacher of Israel, which came with another set of certain pedigree. Nicodemus probably thought something was missing. I think this is why he comes to him. We established this a couple of weeks ago. This is why he comes to him in the cover of dark. This is why he comes asking Jesus questions in a manner where he won't be seen, where his reputation won't be exposed or ruined, rather. And so he knows something's missing, but there's no way he would have ever imagined a chasm like the one Christ just revealed to him. Unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, it's possible that Nicodemus was curious about Jesus' identity. He is in Jerusalem. It's just after Passover. There's many, uh, there would have been many thoughts in the mind of Nicodemus about the Messiah, about him coming to rule the earth. And so maybe he comes wanting to know. In what way is he from God? Because he's already said, we know that you're from God, but in what way? Are you a prophet? Are you a a forerunner to the Messiah? Maybe he's wanting to know, are you the Messiah? Are you going to establish your rule and reign on the earth now or soon? Knowing what is in the heart of man, though, Jesus cuts to the heart of the matter. If you remember at the end of chapter 2, it says that Jesus did not entrust himself to some of the ones who had believed in his name because he knew man. He knew what was in the heart of man. And so he cuts to the heart of the matter. He looks at Nicodemus square in the eyes, and with laser-like focus, he speaks directly to him, and he says, unless you are born again, you will not see the kingdom of God. Jesus exposes Nicodemus. He exposes all his religious efforts. He exposes all of his religious strivings, all of his religious achievements. This great teacher knew nothing about what it takes to enter the kingdom of God. This great teacher would have thought he was seeing in some way the kingdom of God, and Jesus says, you do not see the kingdom of God. His whole life to this point has not gained him anything in God's kingdom And yet Nicodemus can't see that. He doesn't understand that yet. What Christ is saying is that Nicodemus must start over. He must begin again. He must be born again. And the shocking news of the new birth applies to you also. You too must start over. You also are not good enough by your religious pedigree to see the kingdom of God. You also, if you're an unbeliever, will not see the kingdom of God unless you are born again. And so you must be born again, otherwise you will miss the kingdom altogether. And so the shocking news, again, of the new birth, this idea of a new birth, you must be born again, it shocks because it's meant to reveal it's meant to expose, and then on the, on the back side of that, that exposing, we see our need for Christ. We see our need for a Savior. We see our need to be born again. And so we see the good news of a new life in Christ Jesus. Why, though, must somebody be born again? I mean, the question begs to be asked. Nicodemus was surely good enough, Right? Why must somebody be born again? Well, for that, we've got to go back to the beginning of the book. And what we read in Genesis is that when God created mankind, that He created them in His image and likeness, and we know that in that moment there in Genesis 1 and 2, before the fall in Genesis 3, we know that in that moment, in those days, this man and woman were perfect. They were without sin. And when Adam and Eve fall to Satan's temptation in the garden, sin and death entered the world. This is what 
God says to the man about what happens if you eat that fruit of which I have commanded you not to eat, that when you do, you will surely die. Death enters the world. The thing about death entering the world in Genesis chapter 3 is we might initially think that it's just a physical death, that physically you die. But then you get to the end of Genesis 3 and the man and woman are not dead. God spares their life. He kicks them out of the garden, but he spares their life. So there must be another meaning. Surely they will die. Death has entered the world to be sure, but they don't, they're not killed in an instant and God starts over. And so what we know is that another kind of death enters the world in the fall, spiritual death. Mankind is spiritually dead. And so Adam and Eve's nature was no longer perfect, it's fallen. They're no longer spiritually alive, dwelling in the presence of God, they are spiritually dead. Their offspring received the same fallen nature as they're born in the image and likeness of of Adam. To be sure, they're still in the image and likeness of God, but they're not perfect. And this is what Genesis 5, 1 through 3 describes as it describes the descendants of Adam. It says, this is the book of the generations of Adam. When God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. Male and female, he created them, and he blessed them and named them man when they were created. And when Adam had lived 130 years, he fathered a son in his own likeness after his image and named him Seth. And so we see the transition there that mankind's created in the image of God and we still exist in the image of God, but we're broken because we're now born into the likeness and image of Adam. You catch that there in Genesis 5. And so King David even, God's anointed later on in Psalm, King David has just committed the travesties of adultery and murder. And in Psalm 51, he's offering a prayer of repentance. And this is what he's saying about his sin. He's saying, behold, I was brought forth in iniquity. In sin did my mother conceive me. Now, we, we know that David's not saying my mother was sinning as she conceived me. He's saying that at conception, I have a heart that is plagued with sin. I'm fallen, and I'm prone to selfish, sinful desires, O Lord. And this is David being honest in Psalm 51 with God as he's pleading for the mercy of God to not cast him away. The Apostle Paul in Romans 5 gets much more explicit with this idea of what I'm talking about. In Romans 5 verse 12, he's talking about in Romans 5, he's, he's showing us the first Adam and the second Adam, Christ, and how there's death that comes with the first Adam, and then there's life that comes with the second Adam. And this is what he says about the first Adam in verse 12. He says, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. Well, wait a minute. They weren't... They weren't all born yet. They weren't all walking the earth yet. So Paul is affirming what David is saying, that at conception, you're born with a sin nature. In verse 18 of chapter 5, he says it again, one trespass led to condemnation for all men. One trespass led to condemnation for all men. Adam's sin led to condemnation for all. In Romans 3.10, just a couple of chapters before those, Paul's writing, but he's, he's quoting the prophet here. He says, as it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside together. They have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. And so you, by your first birth, you are sinful. By your conception, you are sinful. There's an idea out there that exists that, uh, that an age of accountability happens for a child. And, and that age of accountability is 
varies, it seems, depending on who you talk to. But the idea is that a child is born sinless, without a sin nature, and if you're a parent of a toddler, you're like, whew, that ain't true. They're the most, I mean, as toddlers, we are the most selfish individuals we might ever be. Some of us never grow out of it, right? But there's clearly sin there. And when a child hauls off and hits their brother or sister at two years old, it's not because they're perfect, it's because there's sin present. There's a rebellion in them that's present. And and so children need Christ. Children need the salvation of the Lord. Amen? If not, then maybe Christians shouldn't stand against abortion so ferociously. Because really we would be saving a ton of children by not allowing them to experience sin. But we know that abortion is wrong because murder is wrong. Amen? And so we stand against abortion because it's good and right to stand against abortion. And so we've got to follow our theology to the, the end there and make sure we're consistent. I think the picture is probably mostly clear for you, but if you'll consider what happens when you read Ephesians 2, 1 through 3 in the present tense rather than the past tense as Paul wrote it because Paul's writing to the church at Ephesus, so he's writing to a gathering of people who have been saved. But if you read 2, 1 through 3 as though you've not yet been saved, this is how you would read it. Paul would be saying this, and you are dead in the trespasses and sins in which you walk. Uh, sorry, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all live in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and are by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. And that, that's how Paul describes Christians pre-conversion pre-salvation, pre-regeneration, pre-being born again. He describes them as dead in their trespasses and sins. Now, they're walking, so they're alive. He doesn't mean they're literally dead. He means they're what? Spiritually dead. They're spiritually dead. It's been said, I don't know who coined the phrase, but I think the phrase is good. It's been said that the heart of the human problem is the problem of the human heart. This is true. You look into our world today, I mean, you don't have to look into your world, but we'll use that. You look into the news today, the problem in our world is the problem of the human heart. We, We need salvation. We we need a revival. You, You look into your own life and the problems that you have, the problems that you're going through are either because of your own heart, you're trying to establish your own kingdom, do your own things, or it's inflicted upon you by someone who is doing that, trying to establish their own kingdom, do their own thing, and so they're inflicting harm in that way. The heart of the human problem is the problem of the human heart. We we know that this is true from the Scriptures. It's one of the things that we go over as I, as I do premarital counseling with couples. As we think about conflict resolution in our marriages, conflict comes from, in a marriage, it comes from one person in the marriage saying, I'm building my kingdom. I'm establishing my own kingdom here, and you're in the way of that. And so you end up in conflict. You did this to me, and that imposed upon the walls that I built around my kingdom. And so now we're at conflict with one another. When a husband and wife do not work together to build the kingdom of Christ, they're in danger of establishing their own kingdoms and therefore having a lot of marital conflict. Amen? And so by your first birth, your physical birth, you stand condemned before God by, the, by your sin nature. You stand condemned by the sins that you've committed, the sins that you will commit, and you are sentenced to death. That's what 
Romans 6.23 says. It's for the wages, the payment of sin is death. And so you must be born again. You must be born again. When Jesus says to Nicodemus, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God, he's telling him, you must be born again, Nicodemus. Now, the interesting thing about this is Nicodemus doesn't raise that question, does he? He just says, hey, rabbi, teacher, we, we know that you must be from God because no one can do these things unless, he's, unless God is with him. And Jesus says, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. <laughs> because Jesus knows the heart of the man. The man thinks, hey, I'm... One, he called them signs, so he knows they point to something different. He doesn't call them miracles. We covered that last week. He calls them signs, and so he knows these are meant to show some spiritual truth, and so he comes looking for the answer to the signs. What are these signs showing? And Jesus says, you will not see those things unless you are born again. The, the word again here is is a Greek word called anothen, anothen, I think it's how I'm saying that correctly. What's interesting about this Greek word is it carries two meanings, and it's used for either describing again or from above. And, and so when Jesus says you must be born again, he, he's describing again, you must be reborn, but he's also describing where that birth comes from. He's saying from above. And you don't have, I don't know Greek, I just use Bible study tools that help me. But you don't have to know Greek because Jesus in the rest of the passage makes us explicitly clear where this birth comes from. It comes from the Spirit of God. And so we'll get into that in the coming weeks. But let's look at this idea of being born again, being born anew. That, that initial meaning of being born again. The truth that Jesus is expressing is that you must live a new life. You must have brand new life. You must begin afresh. You must begin anew. You, you cannot patch up the old building. Rather, we need to work on the foundation. We need a new foundation. We're not, we're not trying to add Christ and church and spiritual things to our lives so that we become a patched up building, a whitewashed tomb, as the Pharisees were described by Christ. What we need is an altogether new foundation. You must have, Christ is saying, you must have a new nature. Your old nature is sinful. You need a new nature. Your old nature is dead. You need a nature that is alive. You need an utterly new nature, an altogether new nature. You need new standards. You need new desires. You need a new life. And so Christ is saying, by your first birth, Nicodemus, I know it doesn't look this way, but by your first birth, you are corrupt. You're corrupted. You're bound to sin, and you're destined for eternal condemnation. And so you need a second birth. You must be born again. Your soul needs to be recreated. Which, is, which gets us to the second meaning of, again, this idea that you must be born from above. And so John uses this anothen word in this way two other times in his gospel. In John 3.31, he says, He who comes from above, he who comes anothen is above all. In John 19.11, Jesus is answering uh, Pilate, he says, you would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given you from anothen, from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. John especially has this idea in mind here in John 3.3, 3, to be born from above is to truly be born anew. It's to truly be born again when you're born from above. And so you're in need of a new birth that comes from God, and that coming from God is the only place to find new birth. 
It, it comes from outside of yourself. It's not from within. You, you don't look to yourself. You don't become the fullest expression of yourself. You don't become the truest self that you can, which, which I'd argue you can't achieve anyway unless you're born again. But it's not from pursuing, you know, nirvana that you are born again. It comes from outside of you. It comes from looking to someone else. You don't look to your family. You don't look to your heritage. You look to God alone to be born again. And we see that this is found in Christ. John 1, 12 through 13, again, we, we started the series with this passage, but I'll read it. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. This is the idea of being born again. We know that because in verse 13 he says, Who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So there was nothing about their first birth, nothing about their good works, nothing about their heritage that could cause them to be born again, but they were born again from God. And so the new birth comes from heaven, and when the new birth hits your life, it creates in you a new heart, and it grants to you new life, and that new life is motivated by the motivations of heaven. It's motivated by the motivations of God. You have the desires of God implanted into your life. The truth of the new birth isn't a new concept at all. And that Nicodemus is going to be exposed for not understanding the new birth as this passage unfolds. God had told his people about their need for the new birth through the prophets of the Old Testament. One such prophet is a guy named Ezekiel. And in Ezekiel 36, we read this in verse 26 and 27. He says, and I will give you, this is God speaking to his people about a day that is coming, and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. New birth comes from God. It was always going to come from God. Everything about the Old Testament points to the coming of the Messiah, of Jesus Christ, who would usher in by His perfect sacrifice the new birth. By His death and His resurrection, we would now have the opportunity to have the Spirit of God dwell in us. That's what the amazing event of Pentecost is describing, the Spirit of God coming to dwell in man. And so what, what happens when God gives you a new heart? When God says, I'm going to take your old heart of stone, I'm going to give you a heart of flesh, what's happening in that moment? What ha- what's the result of that. What happens when God says, I'm going to give you a new spirit. I'm going to put my spirit in you. This is the new birth. And so what happens in the new birth? I've laid out at the beginning of the series and kind of mentioned him throughout, but Dr. Stephen Lawson wrote a book on this subject. And here's what he talks about, um, about the new birth. Five things that the new birth does in your life. In the new birth, you get a new heart. And the first thing we see is that you get a new heart to love God. You get a new heart to love God. Once you were not a lover of God, and now in the new birth, you receive a new heart and you are a lover of God. Once you put all sorts of things above God, once you had many gods, including yourself, and now you have one God and you put nothing above Him. The new birth is the result of receiving a new heart and instills in you a new love for God, a real love for God, a genuine love for God. This exchanged heart possesses new desires for the kingdom of God. It throbs with new affections for the truth of God, and it beats in sync with God. 
Now we love what God loves and we reject what he rejects. And in a similar way, we do not love what we once, re- I'm sorry, we love what we once rejected and we reject what we once loved. We've been transformed by this new heart, and our new heart longs for God. We love Him. As the psalmist says, as a deer pants for the water, O my soul will thirst for you, O God. If you don't have a thirsting for God, you need to ask yourself, have I truly been born again? The second thing Lawson points out is you get a new mind to think right thoughts about God and His works. Again, once we thought wrong things about God. Maybe you were a scoffer, a mocker of God and His people. When you have a new birth from above, you now have the ability to think rightly about God and His work. Ephesians 4, 22 through 24 talks about this idea of sanctification. It says to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. The new birth gives us an entirely new mindset. And we see life as God sees it. We're happy to let go of the former manner of life so that we can take on God's manner for life. We're able to see with a new understanding what God says in His Word. We see how His truth relates to our life and we put it on happily, joyfully. We recognize, again, as the psalmist says in Psalm 16, That he has made known to us the path of life, and at his right hand are pleasures forevermore. The third thing we get with a new heart is we get a new heart to believe God's word. The new heart accepts 2 Timothy 3.16, which says that all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching and for reproof and for correction and for training in righteousness. And verse 17 says that the man of God may be fully mature or complete, lacking nothing. And so we have a new desire, a new heart toward His Word. We believe God's Word, and it transforms us. Again, Psalm 119, David says there, well, it's not confirmed it's David. I believe it's David. He says that I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. He says there about God's word that it is sweeter than drops of honey. It's to be more desirable than silver and gold. You see the transformation of a heart towards the word of God when somebody is born again. They're no longer a skeptic of the Word, they're believers of the Word. They don't doubt its validity, its truthfulness. They don't doubt its inspiration. They don't doubt its infallibility. They don't doubt any of those things. Instead, they humbly submit themselves to the Word of God. Because in it is life. In it is all things necessary for godliness and salvation. In it is the answer to every problem. In it is wisdom for every situation. And so they humbly come to it. A new birth gives you a new heart full of praise for God. So once you were negative towards the Lord, once you didn't love the Lord at all, once you may have talked bad about the Lord, but now you bring praise to God. Once we were self-absorbed and we praised ourselves and we thought only of ourselves and now we've stopped gazing at our own belly buttons and we're looking to the Lord. We're, We're staring at Him. We're walking towards Him. We're moving His direction. And praise for God, which used to be a struggle for us, somebody would praise the Lord for something, we'd kind of wince about that, like, ah, come on. Does God really care about that? Does God really, was he really involved in that? I mean, looks like that was just simply the doctors doing something to me. You you wince at God. You wince at the idea of God being involved in life. And now, praise for God freely flows from your tongue. 
blessing instead of cursing are on your lips. The fifth thing we see, the final thing, a new birth gives us a new heart to obey God. What we're describing here about the new birth is a desire to obey the Lord, to make Him Lord of everything, to see Him as Lord and to submit to Him as Lord of every area of our life. Jesus says in John 14, 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. He doesn't say to earn my love, you must keep my commandments. And John later says in his epistles that we love because Christ first loved us. We love because he first loved us. He initiated the relationship. He started the contact and we're responding in love. If you had a good father growing up, You loved to obey his commands. Maybe not all of them, but it brought you joy if you had a good father growing up to obey his commands. If you had a bad father growing up, then this idea of loving someone by obeying their commands might be a real struggle for you. But when you know that the father is perfect and he's good and he's holy and righteous and he never means anything uh, for your harm, Even the bad things that He allows in your life are not meant for your harm, they're for your good, they're for your growth, your development, your maturity, your strengthening. And so you happily then submit to Him. I love the Lord because He saved me from my sins. I was once dead in my trespasses and sins, and now I'm alive in Christ Jesus because of the work of God in my life. I'll give Him everything. There's not an area of my life that I will not submit to His rule and reign. That doesn't mean I haven't struggled to submit to his rule and reign in areas of my life. I absolutely have. And I'm sure I will still. But it's not my deepest desire. My deepest desire is to submit to God in every way. This is evidence of a new life in Christ, of a new birth. The new birth takes us off of our old path. It puts us on an entirely new path of obedience to God. The world is behind you and heaven is before you, and it's your central focus. As you can see, being born again then utterly transforms your life. You are literally turned into a new creation in Christ Jesus. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, that means to take hold of with your eyes and don't let go. The new has come. Behold, the new has come. If you are born again, you are now alive in Christ. If you're born again, you should now be pursuing Him, not running from Him. And you pursue Him with every part of your being, with everything that you are. Again, the shocking news of your need for new birth reveals the saving news of salvation in Christ Jesus. And so I ask, have you been born again? Have you been born from above? Have you been born anew? Have you received Christ and so received new life in Him? John 3, 3, Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Truly, truly is used to declare the utter truthfulness of something, that there are not truer words that can be spoken. Jesus is quite literally saying, I, the amen, the amen, say it to you. He's saying, I, the faithful and true witness, say this to you. Nicodemus, you can take this statement to the bank that there is nothing more true. This is the truest of true, and it's been declared to you by the Son of God that you must be born again, or you will not see the kingdom of God. The the Greek words here, the, the phrase cannot see, reveals a lack of power to perceive something by sight. It means you lack the the power. 
Not that you're blind physically, but that there's, there's a otherworldly power, a supernatural power, which must be present in you to see the kingdom of God. And so this coincides with this idea of being born from above. When you're born from above, you have an otherworldly power. Amen? You've been supernaturally transformed. The Spirit of God is now inside of you, and He's granted to you new life. And so in that power, you can see the kingdom of God. But if you've not been born from above, you cannot see the kingdom of God. This means that the kingdom of God excludes all of those who are unregenerate. There's not a heaven for the unsaved. There's not... There's not a limbo for them to rest in once they pass. Do you feel the gravity of that? Unless you were born again, there is no life in you. And there will be no life for you in eternity. You will stand forever condemned. And so we don't beat our chest as those who have been born again, gloating that we have new life. We feel the gravity of this statement. And it ought to motivate us to share the good news of Jesus Christ with everyone that we come into contact with. Without the message of the gospel, there is no salvation for anyone. God has commissioned you, minister of reconciliation, ambassador for Christ. God has commissioned you to be an evangelist, to share the good news with your children, with your spouse, with your neighbors, your students, your coworkers, the guy who washes your car person you're standing next to in the aisle at the grocery store, and wherever you have an opportunity. God has given you a dinner table in your home, not just so your family can gather, but so that you can practice hospitality with unbelievers, to invite them in, to be able to share the good news of Christ with them. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Christ is leaving no other option here. He's leaving no other option. And so we shouldn't explain away sinfulness. We shouldn't explain away depravity. We shouldn't explain away this idea that you were born with a sin nature. As though like, well, surely a good God won't send people to hell. Would he really be good if he overlooked sin? No. There's no justice in that. And so we must be born again. And we must be ministers of this being born again. The kingdom of God will contain all of the people across time and space who have and will receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior through the new birth. That's who will see the kingdom of God. No one else. Nicodemus was looking for an earthly reign in the Messiah, but Christ came to first establish a kingdom that he says is not from this world. And one day when he splits the heavens open and he descends in his return, the second coming of our Savior, when he does that, he'll establish his kingdom in the new heavens and the new earth, but it'll be too late for unbelievers. That's when judgment will come. And so we... This is what Jesus says again to to Pilate. He's asking him, are you a king? If you are, where's your kingdom at? And Jesus says to him, he says, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews, but my kingdom is not from this world. The kingdom is from above because it is made up of people who have been born anew from above. 
and its leader is from above. Its Savior, its Lord is King, and He reigns from above. God is redeeming a people unto Himself through the finished work of Christ on the cross. Make no doubt And He's doing it through regenerating people by the power of His Spirit. And those people will dwell with Him eternally in heaven. Revelation 7, again, the Apostle John, he's he's all over the New Testament. In Revelation chapter 7, the same guy who wrote the Gospel of John writes Revelation. And this is what he says as he's giving this vision From the Lord, he says in Revelation 7, verse 9 through 10, And after this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb." Amen. Brothers and sisters, this is the hope of the new heaven and new earth. And you may not see it yet. You may not see it yet. But hold on. The day of Christ is approaching. And for now, you live as sojourners in this land. Your gaze is to be fixed on the hills of Zion as you go through this life. And the day when all is made right because Jesus Christ comes into view, that day is coming. It's coming. The only way you can see the kingdom of God, partially for now and in full later on, is if you have been born again. This is the only way. Jesus says in John 10, oh, sorry, John 14, that I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And so I ask again, have you been born again? And maybe you're kind of in that place of, man, I don't know. Let me describe for you Again, using some of Lawson's points here, let me describe for you what the what being born again looks like, in case it's not clear yet. If you have been born again, you will surely see a dramatic change in your life. You're no longer the person you once were, but you have become a new person in Christ Jesus. You've received so much more than the forgiveness of sins. It's, it's not a ticket to heaven. It's not, you know, it's not fire insurance. It's so much more. You've received a new life that transforms you at the deepest level of who you are. It changes your heart literally from being dead in sin to alive in Christ. You've been altered at the very base of your soul. God has put His Spirit within you. You've received a heart transplant to love God more than anything or anyone else in this world. And so you have a new heart that desires to obey God. You have a heart that no longer wants to go its own way. not saying you don't don't fiddle with that at times, right? Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. We know this is our heart. And so we're begging God, take us, seal us by your Spirit. And that's what you get in Ephesians 1, 13 and 14, that you've been sealed by the Spirit of God. It's a sign of your salvation and it's a seal of its effect. And the Spirit of God will not let you fall away. Moreover, you've received a new desire to want to know God. You're no longer content to merely know about Him. You've you've received a new heart to believe God, to trust His Word, to go to it for daily guidance. You're in love with the Word of God. Your new heart praises God. You no longer direct attention to yourself. Rather, you are directing attention to God. You live to magnify the name of the Lord above all else. 
And if you've been born again, that's the supernatural transformation from above that has taken effect in your life. Let me pray for you. Would you stand to your feet this morning? Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you, Lord, for your kindness in in saving us, your kindness in granting to us salvation. Father, I, I do pray for anyone in here who has not experienced this new birth from above. Maybe they've adapted to the Christian life. Maybe they've taken on some of the the moral effects of it. And so their God is moralism. Their God is not Christ. Father, I pray that you would reveal that to them. Remove the blinders from their eyes that they might see Christ today. And I pray for anyone in here who's who's walking with you, yes, who is a new creation, yes, who has experienced a new birth, but who is wrestling with their flesh. And, And maybe so much so that they wonder, have I received a new life? Lord, I pray that you would that you would comfort them, not in their sin, but comfort their spirits, Lord, that they would be sure of their salvation, that they would know you and know you well, and that they would continue to fight the good fight of faith, to continue to wage war against their flesh, to put to death the old man so that the new man may come alive. Father, we thank you again for the salvation we've received in Christ. It is on him that we depend. And we thank you that Hebrews 7 tells us he is able to save to the uttermost all of those who draw near to you through him. Lord, help us to do that. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen.